everybody. Welcome to this week's podcast. No special announcements or anything this week, so let's jump right in and see what we got. The previously unreleased Xbox 360 port of GoldenEye was leaked out to the public and we got a ton of footage available across a few different channels. Now, the game is out there to download. You'll have to just use some creative Googling. It's probably best that we don't post a link to that. Uh, and there's even more information being let out of why the port was never released officially to the public and what happened with that. But overall, it just looks like a really, really impressive version of the game. And while, of course, the N64 version was an absolute iconic N64 game, I think everybody would agree that stuff like that would really benefit from higher frame rates and more resolution, and that's exactly what it looks like this is. So if you're interested, check out the long play that Chris posted. I know Digital Foundry also did a live stream, um, and there's a bunch of other info floating out there. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting story, and I really think anybody who loves the game would probably uh, find it worth their time to go watch some of these videos and really see what could have been for such a cool game. Retrobit has just announced their version of a GC video adapter that they're calling the Prism, which works pretty much like all the other plug-and-play GC video adapters, and that it goes into the digital output of any GameCube that has one. So basically, it's compatible with every GameCube worldwide as long as it actually has that digital port, and outputs HDMI video at either the original resolution, or it can line double 240p or deinterlace 480i. So it's basically a typical GC video solution running the latest firmware, but the big difference between this and all the rest is you could use the USB-C port on the side for firmware updates. Now, it's kind of funny because the last few revisions of the GC Video firmware allowed you to then use Homebrew software to update the firmware right on the GameCube itself. So it's kind of funny that up until that point, and including every adapter that's out there now that's still on older firmware, you need to take a hardware programming device in order to flash the new firmware on it. And then afterwards, if you want to, you're able to software update just right through the GameCube itself. And it's funny that this has the ability to flash the firmware when it already has the firmware that you could do it through Homebrew. But it's still an addition that I think is worthwhile. I think a lot of people out there are probably just more comfortable plugging something into their PC and running an update program than trying to mess around with Homebrew when they really haven't had any experience on it. I think most people I know that use Swiss, as much as it's an amazing piece of software and I love using it, I think most people just use it to set basic features and don't really dig into any of the extra stuff. So it's cool that that's an option. Um, this is at the moment going to be uh, exclusive to Castlemania, or at least the pre-orders will, and you could pre-order it now for $80. It comes with the Prism, a remote control, and it should ship in March, so around a month from now. Um, I'm going to pick one up just to see what it's like, uh, and with respect to Retrobit, as long as they didn't screw anything up, it should be a good solution. Uh, and I mean that respectfully, but there's other excellent GC video solutions out there. So, uh, you know, as long as they followed suit and made it with a high quality connector, um, you know, a decent build quality and there's no weird bugs, then it should be something that anybody could feel comfortable using. But I'll get one to check out as soon as it's released and let everybody know, but I would expect it to be totally fine. Terra Onion has just announced that they're dropping the price of the SSD S3, and both their stores as well as Stone Age Gamer already have the discount applied, uh, so feel free to buy it from both of those with a slightly cheaper price. Now, for anybody that is not unaware, the SSD S3 is a device that plugs into any Turbo Graphics or PC Engine console that has an expansion port. So, Turbo Graphics, Core Graphics, PC Engine, the uh, Super Graphics, basically not the duos and not the handheld. Um, and it is an optical drive emulator as well as a Hue card uh, ROM cart, and it outputs audio and video. And, uh, you know, a question I get all the time from people that saw the original video I did on different PC Engine solutions is, is the SSD S3 fixed? Um, it's been fixed for quite a long time now. So, uh, I, you know, I always debate, do I leave that video up? Do I take it down? But I think the rest of the video is totally relevant. And if you end up picking up one of these used someday and find problems with it, at least now that might point you in the direction as to what the issue is. But yeah, for a very, very long time now, uh, like, 
two years almost, the uh, uh, SSD S3 has been in good shape, and it's a it's a quality device. But you do also have to realize that almost every PC engine and turbo graphics I've used has jail bars as a result of the console, not any of the adapters. So if you get one of these and you end up liking the video out of it, awesome. If you get one and there's jail bars and uh, you know it's something that bothers you, look into the console five cap replacement kits for them. It's literally just two capacitors. They're surface mount caps, but they're not too hard to get to. Uh, and it's as long as you have some modding experience, it should be okay. I definitely would not recommend it as one of your first mods, but it is not too bad. So um, either way, I just wanted to bring that point up because I know a lot of times with plug and play solutions, if you if no one had ever explained it to you, how would you know that it's not the plug and play solutions fault that there's jail bars? There'd be no reason to because you would have no previous experience. But once again, whether it's the spark plug, whether it's the graphics booster or whether it's this thing, it all all of that jail bar stuff still applies. Doesn't really matter. It's all plug and play solutions. So there you go. Price drop for the SSD S3. Pick it up from either store. And uh, if you're using this stuff for the first time, just you know, be warned that you might need to do an extra little mod on the inside to fix the jail bars. Okay, this next subject is absolutely near and dear to my heart, so I promise I will try my best to keep it short because I could probably ramble about this forever, but the French exclusive Dreamcast game Taxi 2 just got an English translation for the first time. Now, this is not Crazy Taxi. This is based off of the Taxi movie series from France that are some of my favorite movies of all time. One and two are amazing. Two is probably in my top five favorite movies. And just imagine like a fun action comedy like Lethal Weapon, but with cars. So it's I, I'm not doing it justice saying it that way, but whatever. Um, now, this game was made by Ubisoft, and you could kind of tell they were rushed to release. Um, I couldn't get past the first level of it after trying, but it was really interesting to see the game itself, especially because it was a game I didn't even know existed. And a group of very awesome people got together to translate the entire game, including adding proper subtitles to the FMV scenes. I didn't get to watch too many of them because I didn't get too far in the game. However, they did absolutely nail the translations. And that's something that's been a problem with these movies in the past because I bought a bunch of different versions. And uh, it actually, I, I told the full story uh, on the live stream I did, but I was introduced to these movies by somebody that translated them for me basically as the movies were, were in real time. And when I eventually bought the DVDs myself, a few versions had really bad translations. They totally missed the jokes. Um, and it wasn't even just literal translations versus getting the flow right. I mean, they got a bunch of stuff wrong. So I was kind of interested to see how they would approach this. And they absolutely nailed the translation of what I saw. I did a live stream with Ronnie going through this. Um, not my best live stream, only because I didn't get very far in the game. But it was fun to hang out with Ronnie. It was fun to talk to the people that translated it. Um, they were in the chat. And I believe, unless I read it wrong, I believe somebody that actually worked on the original game jumped in for a minute too, which was absolutely incredible. And that, that made me kind of more nervous too, because all these people that worked on this game were watching me play it badly. So <laughs> my apologies. Um, and then Ronnie and I jumped into Crazy Taxi and Daytona, just one quick round of both of them, just to kind of give a sense of what what was the example of the best you could find on the Dreamcast versus what this game was. And then we played Taxi 2 and 3 on Game Boy Color, which are games that I also didn't even know existed. And they were both kind of fun. Taxi 2 is a totally a game I would play if I just had some time to kill and wanted to play a fun racing game. The third one was a little weird because it felt like a racing game, but you had to make stops and stuff. I'm not really sure how to describe it. Definitely check out the live stream and skip to the end if you want uh, just the Game Boy Color versions of it. But it was really really cool to experience games that I never even knew existed, especially when it was about a subject or in this case, a movie that I, I was really into. So it was fun to, to kind of experience this. And uh, I appreciated so much everybody that took the time to translate it. Um, you know, and it's cool that the game even exists. I think up until recently, relatively recently, movie versions of games have never been known to be the greatest games. And it didn't really get past that for a while. So 
you know, I, I just, I, I still think it was an awesome experience. Really l- love that Ronnie took the time to help translate the games for me as well. Uh, the Game Boy Color games. I wouldn't have been able to figure out what to do if he wasn't there. And just a quick note on a personal note for anybody that watched the U.S. version of Taxi. That's not the same movie. Obviously, I'm not talking about Robert De Niro, Taxi Driver, but Queen Latifah did a version of it with Jimmy Fallon. And while she was awesome, the whole rest of the movie was garbage. So if you think that's what the taxi movies are like, please take the time to get a subtitled version of the original and check that out. I promise you it's well worth it and a totally different feel than the very terrible re-release of it. There's a new IPS backlit screen kit available for the Neo Geo Pocket Color, and the screen this time is slightly bigger than the original. So a quick little bit of history on this and why that's important. A while back, Ben Venn came out with a kit and was the first person, as far as I remember, to ever be able to get a color backlit screen installed into a Neo Geo Pocket Color. It was absolutely awesome. The only slight downside was that the screen that was compatible was slightly smaller than the original screen of the Neo Geo Pocket Color. So while it wasn't too big of a deal and the the trade-off was definitely worth it, you did have to get a 3D printed little bracket in order to fill the space in and it was noticeably smaller. I do think it was worth it for most people though, but whenever you're messing with handhelds, I do always prefer when the screen gets bigger, not smaller. Uh, And that's exactly what this new kit does. Um, It's an IPS backlit screen. It's slightly bigger than the original. And Tito from Macho Nacho Productions uh, did a really awesome installation and overview video on it. Um, Definitely check it out and check out his channel as well. My Life in Gaming featured him. I'm pretty sure I've talked about him before, but if I haven't, I've certainly seen a bunch of his videos. Um, And the the video he posted summarizes pretty much everything. The only thing I would like to point out about the video that I I was really happy to see is that he used an aftermarket case in order to mount this new screen because you have to cut some of the original case. And anybody that's been following this channel knows how I'm annoyingly uh, upfront about how much I don't like to cut any original plastic. And this is the perfect, perfect example of it. Um, What if this new backlit screen turns out like those Game Boy Color backlit screens and we get a new one every other week with the next company claiming theirs is the best and the brightest and the whatever, and we just have a new flux of these screens coming through. What if you cut your original plastic on these, and they're definitely going up in price, and you install this kit that's the best and the greatest, and a year or two later, a much better alternative comes out. Maybe somebody makes a custom OLED. I don't think they will. I'm just saying. Uh, Now what are you going to do? Your your plastic's already cut. And the fact that you would buy a replacement aftermarket shell to do this means no big deal anymore. What if the next screen that comes out doesn't require any cutting at all? Beautiful. Put your original back on. What if, you know, what if it requires cutting even more? Cool. You've already hacked up the replacement screen. Keep hacking at it, whatever. So I was just uh, really happy to see Tito use that because I'm obviously a fan of all no cut mods for this exact reason. Also, if you would like uh, a ROM cart for it to kind of discover the full library, one does exist. Um, And I did a video a while back on it. Uh, It was a couple years ago, and I haven't seen it probably since within a week or two of making it. So I don't know if it's embarrassingly bad or if it's good enough for when it was made, but the facts in it are all pretty much the same. It's a well-performing, good ROM cart that you could rely on and an excellent way to just discover the whole Neo Geo Pocket Color library and see which games you'd really want to buy or which games you're like, oh yeah, glad I experienced that. So glad I've used the ROM cart instead of dropping all that money on it. So... At least that's how I certainly approach these things. But definitely check out the Macho Nacho production video. Um, And uh, I'm getting one in soon to check out. I'll probably just do a social media post, not a video or anything on it. But I'm excited to try it. Scarlet Sprites just uploaded a video that is a first look at the Mr. Cade project. Uh, And that's essentially a way to integrate a Mr. into your arcade machine. Now, it's not available yet. As soon as pre-orders open on it, I'll make sure to let everybody know and I'll be making a big deal about it because I'm always super excited about Mr. stuff. But if you want more info on what it's like, definitely check out Joe's video on it. I think it's just the perfect introduction. Um, I will also be doing my own video on it. I have one here as well, but... 
I think I'm going to take a slightly different approach just so I don't repeat the same thing that other people have already done. And my video is going to be more about how I integrated it into the weird little cabinet I have. Uh, mostly just so people who might be in similar situations could see what I did and maybe that would help them as well. Um, if you have a standard arcade cab that you're putting it in, which hopefully I could eventually get a place big enough to fit one of those, uh, then it would be a little bit more standard than having to do any extra work. I mean, if your cab is already wired for six buttons you should be able to just plug this in with pretty much no configuration and the mr configuration itself is super easy these days so uh, the only other thing i would add to this which i believe joe already talks about is i do always prefer getting a little mini wireless keyboard to just in case I need to access any settings on my mister. And in fact, when I added that to my regular standalone mister, the workflow totally changed and it was never frustrating anymore because there was always something that I would mess up or some setting or, or a scenario in which I needed to go find a USB keyboard and to have a cheap $20 reliable thing that I could just keep laying around and just every time I need to access something, power it on or even messing around with 486 cores. I would never use one of these little devices to actually sit and type but if you just need to mess with something um, I highly recommend getting that um, and the only other thing that I'm having an issue with uh, is I really like those TP-Link uh, miniature Wi-Fi modules I think it works perfect on my standard mister but with this buried inside an arcade machine I really think I might prefer one that's USB with an external antenna that I could mount on the outside so I guess we'll see how that works in uh, whenever I finish up my video of it. But overall, if you have an arcade machine, you should really think about getting one of these because it's just a very cool way to integrate stuff in. And I even found myself playing console games that would fit well in an arcade scenario on this too. So I wouldn't play Sonic the Hedgehog on my arcade machine, but Eternal Champions is fun. There's a, a new patch out for that, which I'll probably write about next week anyway. That was kind of neat to experience on an arcade machine. So overall, I just, I'm very excited. In case you couldn't tell, everything Mr. Related gets me really happy, but I think this one's going to be a really, really cool project for people. Anybody that has an X station and one of the 3D printed SD mounts from LaserBear should probably reroute the cable. Greg from LaserBear posted a video on it and it's not really a big deal. It's more preventative maintenance and there's certainly nothing to worry about so much, but I'm really happy that he brought it to everybody's attention. Uh, basically just disassemble the top. You don't have to desolder anything. You don't have to mess with the X station installation at all. Just pop the top off, pop the 3D printed part out, and then run the flex cable underneath the X station, not between the X station and the 3D printed uh, shell itself. And if you were having any issues, it's probably fixed. If you weren't having any issues at all, I certainly wasn't. You know, it's, it's good practice. There's also another bracket that he made, which is one of those things that just to add for peace of mind. You don't need it, but he is offering it for like a dollar or something um, in case you know you decide that you want that extra protection. And I believe that anybody who buys the kit from the time he discovered this on will get that in the, in the kit for free. But it's just one of those things where I'm personally not going to worry about it, but maybe the next time I buy something from Laser Bear, I'll throw that in the cart too, just to have. I don't really know, but I'm probably not gonna worry about it. I think his new routing solution should fix everything. Obviously, correct me in the comments if you think I'm wrong about this. I always love uh, I always love feedback and I'm often wrong. So, but I do think just rerouting the flex cable should be all that you need to do and you don't have to worry about anything. So, for more info, definitely check out the post and uh, and of course his video on it. And if you don't know anything about PlayStation 1 optical drive emulators, I do have a video on that that should pretty much sum everything up. I didn't include the mode in it because PS1 support wasn't out for the mode yet, but I think this is pretty much all you need to know and that, you know, do you want, which type of solution do you want and here's how they perform. The fan translation of Bahamut Lagoon has just reached version 1.0. Now, a few weeks ago, this was released as a beta, and while the game was fully playable to completion, they did find a couple of script errors and a few lingering bugs that should all be ironed out to the point where they're calling it a 1.0 release. 
And on top of that, they're also releasing the source code for the patch along with it for anybody that wants to take this patch and translate it into any other language besides English, which is absolutely amazing because not only has this team spent the ridiculous amount of time it takes to translate an RPG, but then they're putting the tools out to allow other people to do so to other languages. Um, if you'd like the full story on the game, uh, on exactly what went on with the translation and what went into it, please check out Alex's previous post. This is more of just a quick update like, hey, if you were interested in playing this, make sure to get the latest patch. And if you're already playing it, uh, just repatch the an original ROM with this one and just continue playing. But know that most of the bugs, if not all, have been ironed out by now. So, I mean, as I said before, I'm always super appreciative whenever anybody takes the time to translate anything. So the, the fact that a team has really gone above and beyond with this is, is really incredible. So if you want to experience the game for the first time, go for it. Two more games have been converted from the Atomus Wave platform to the Dreamcast. And this time it's two games that were previously unreleased officially. The first game is Kenju, which combines cel-shaded 3D graphics with 2D gameplay, and I guess plays similarly to Rival Schools. And the next one is Force 5, which is a 3D fighter which later became Jinji Storm the Arcade. So I'm impressed enough just patching a Thomas Wave games to run on the Dreamcast, but now on top of that, we also have two previously unreleased games to add to the list. So absolutely awesome that these are being done. Um, and for reference, I already have a list of everything that's been translated, uh, you know, how to tweak performance of them, a little blurb on the, you know, what it is in, or what are these games, uh, and a list of any ones that haven't been ported yet, if there's even any left that's worth porting. So just such an impressive thing from the start, but the fact that we also get unreleased games to play now too is really awesome. So uh, if you have any way of playing Dreamcast backups, I would definitely look into these. Here's something I am super excited about. Just this morning, Sorg posted a beta RBF file that allows the NES Mr. Core to run at 1080p 5x. And if you're a supporter of Sorg, all you got to do is download the file, follow the instructions on how to change your settings to install it, and you could give it a try. And then Sorg also asked for feedback, so be careful what you wish for, because this is my feedback. Um, I, I was really excited about it, and I wanted to to kind of discuss this openly, because while I've discussed this before a lot, I never wrote a post about it, because it'd be kind of rude to write a post asking for a feature for, for developers that do all this stuff for free, basically. Uh, but the question was posed, so, he, uh, you know, what's your feedback? Here's my answer. 1080p 5x is something that I think is awesome, and if you're using a standard TV, so 1080p or 4K, not a computer monitor like 1200p or 1440p, this really, in my opinion, is the best way to retain the sharpest image while filling the whole screen. And I'd like to explain a little bit why, and I definitely am going to be including this in upcoming videos, and if you'd like, I could probably even do a separate short video just about this, but here's kind of how all of this works. In retro gaming, we generally like to integer scale our image, so uh, nearest neighbor doubling or tripling or quadrupling of the image to retain the exact sharpness and that blocky look, which would be terrible for video, uh, and not even good for the later 3D games, but for classic games, it is the sharpest way to scale that image onto a modern digital TV, capture card, whatever. And in doing so, you're scaling the 240p resolution. But 240p is more of a nickname than anything else when you're talking about specifically about classic consoles, because most classic games really are only about 224 pixels high. Now, some games reach the full 240 resolution, but that's kind of one of those aside, you know, actually moments. Really, most of them are about 224 high. So what exactly does that mean then? Well, if you're scaling to 720p, it means that you're actually scaling 3x to 672 pixels. So 240 times 3 is 720, but 224 times 3 is 672, which means you have 24 pixels that are all black on top and on bottom on the bottom of the image, which is why you don't normally see the full screen vertically being used when you're scaling these. And when you get to 1080p, it gets much weirder because a 4x scale 
actually results in 896 pixels, which leaves 184 pixels unused, which is a ton of wasted space around the image. Now, if you would like, there are 4.5x scaling methods out there, which look good, and the Mister has implemented some really, really amazing scaling stuff, which stretches it to the point where it's not quite as sharp as an integer scale, but I don't know if anybody would notice. It really works out well, um, but I do think that going to 5x has some advantages. So uh, just some basic math, Scaling a 224 high image to 5x results in 1120, which means that 20 pixels are cut off from the top and bottom of the image. But when doing so, you're also zooming in farther, which means that it's filling up more horizontal resolution of your widescreen flat panel TV, which is always a good thing. Uh, and I'm not talking about pressing the 16 by 9 button and stretching it like a crazy person. I mean, uh, actually filling the screen properly. Now, just the fact that it fills the screen is cool, but here's some of the other interesting things about 5X. CRT has had something called overscan, which basically you couldn't see the outer edges of the CRT. And many times growing up, I remember using some cheap TV that I, I found in a garbage bin that you'd have to like twist two wires together to get it to turn on. And having things like the doors in the original Legend of Zelda, when you're going through the dungeons, half of the door is cut off by the CRT, so you can't quite ever really see the bottom. And I really think that not only did developers keep that in mind and intentionally not put so much stuff at the top and bottom, but I think in many cases, 5X cuts off less than that. And there's two really perfect examples. The first one is a screenshot from the new Nest Core, that, uh, the beta core that Sorg posted, that shows that 5X doesn't cut anything useful off from the screen at all. And it's really like that with almost every single, if not every single, NES and SMS game, and probably 2600 and a bunch of others as well, where the 5X scale cuts off nothing important. And you could tell that they, uh, the developers added extra ground and extra sky to compensate for this. But I also think that it's a perfectly good fit for any other games that don't use a full 240 resolution, and I guess maybe even some that do. And here's another example, uh, Zelda A Link to the Past. 4X scale on top, 5X scale on the bottom, both you're using the open source scan converter. And if you see, uh, all of these pictures are available full size for anybody that wants to check out the post, but if you take a look at it, you can see that the 5X scale cuts a tiny, tiny bit of the image off. It doesn't actually cut the door off, but it does cut a little bit of the viewable area off. So one of the feedback that I wanted to provide, if, if this is easy, giant if, because I don't know anything about programming, um, if the mister had the ability to just move the image up or down, like the CPS HDMI kit and like Marcus does, that same exact scale. Uh, and in order to do this, I just did a, a direct capture and then scaled manually. But if I was able to move that up maybe five pixels, so the image is shifted up a little bit, um, then it would fit the full playable area of the bottom of the screen and everything that's cut off on the top, it's, it's still more useless information. So I guess that's kind of the my shortest possible way of giving an overview of why 5X, I think, is the best method for standard TVs, uh, you know, 1080p and uh, 4K TVs, because it fills the most amount of screen while keeping an integer scale without stretching. And I really don't think you lose any usable info at all. And in the moments that you might cut a little bit of the HUD off, I would just point you to some of the Neo Geo games that, that put the HUDs so far to the top and the bottom, uh, even if you use emulation, part of it's cut off anyway. It's just the way they were programmed. So that's kind of my feedback for that. The only thing I would add is, you know, yes, I would love to see 5X. Thank you for putting this beta out. If the image shift is easy, then, you know, please consider that as well. Once again, though, that's a big if, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe using a scaler to shift the image is, is relatively easy, but programming that in Verilog is a nightmare. I don't want to add any extra work to developers that already put so much of their time into all of this stuff. 
Um, but the question was asked, so I definitely wanted to answer it with as much detail as possible, both to give feedback to the Mr. Team, as well as to kind of explain to other people what 5X is before this, if this feature is implemented, before it is, so people know what they're getting into. Now, there is one more thing that's probably worth addressing, and anytime any product starts to get more features, you start to always worry about, feature bloating and supporting all of those extra features. And I do think there is a very easy answer for this based on the many years I did hardware development and all of the years I do support, which technically retro RGB is just a support platform. So based on all of that, I think the easiest way around stuff like this, if you're worried about supporting more things, is bury the feature. Now, I'd love to see toggles and nice menus, and while I've been doing the command line since the command line was was a thing, like I do like to see a nice graphic interface, but if you're worried about people using a feature that don't really understand it, make it hard to find. Easy to use, but hard to find, because I do totally understand if you were to make 1080p 5x the default resolution, you would end up having a lot of people that said, hey, I loaded up, you know, my favorite Super Nintendo game and part of the screen's cut off. You broke it. What's wrong with your core? And I, I understand that that might be a concern, but if you just make it a feature where somebody has to manually add a video line to the INI file, you know, don't put it as a default in the INI, just put it in the GitHub or something. If somebody goes through the trouble of understanding what they're doing, learning how to do that and doing that, they're most likely already going to know the answer to these questions and you're not going to have to support a single thing. Uh, and then that also allows a lot more time of testing new features and a lot more feedback. And if you do end up getting a bunch of weird support things about it, leave it buried. And if it turns out to be a really happy feature and your only complaint is why isn't it a toggle? There you go. That's your answer. So, uh, you know, in case you can't tell, I absolutely love the Mr. Project and I do love everything about it. I love the community contributions. I love that people do this just based on their, uh, on their, the love and passion they have for the consoles and the electronics around them. And as do I for all of this stuff. So uh, while I'm not smart enough to be able to program, maybe this is my contribution in that if you do put out a 5X mode, which once again, it is beta and they're only testing it, it might not be something they even release, but if they do put it out, maybe that's my video. Maybe the, it's, Mr. 5X Explained, and I go through everything that I went through in this rant uh, with fancier pictures and much, much better graphics to, to visualize the points, and maybe I also include how to set it up, what to look for, what to avoid, and basically take away a lot of that first level support just by providing documentation in a video that explains it. So um, while I wish I was smart enough to write a core or help out, maybe this is my way of helping. So I will absolutely offer that up to you, the amazing Mr. Team. If you want to add 1080p 5x, uh, let me know like a week in advance and I can have a video scheduled to launch at the same time to explain it for people. So you all won't have to spend your time doing that. You could spend your time doing the stuff that nobody else can, like making these insanely amazing cores. So that's uh, my, my very long answer to does anybody have any feedback, but I really hope it was more helpful than ranty because I really just, I know a lot of you already know what 1080p 5x is, but maybe now you'd have an easier way to explain it to your friends, or maybe people listening that don't know what it's like or what it is have an idea what it's like now. Uh, so I guess I'll just end this here and just once again say thank you to the whole Mr. Team for always putting out such exciting stuff. Well, that's it for this time. I hope I didn't lose most of you through that whole 1080p 5x thing. Uh, I really am just so positive and excited about that. And if anybody was listening audio only and, and interpreted it as a rant, uh, I, I really hope it didn't come across that way. I had a giant smile on my face the whole time and it's just stuff that makes me really happy to talk about. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I didn't just lose everybody during all of that. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and listening. And of course, and especially thank you so much to everybody that supports in absolutely any way, because it really is what's keeping the channel, the website, the podcast and everything else around it going. So thank you all so much and I'll see you next week.